briefly about holding your public officials accountable and uh, a proper process of service. I think a lot of people miss the importance of the 3811 and the 3877, okay? So type it into your computers. 3811 is a green return receipt card. 3877 is, uh, um, oh, good gravy, it eludes me at this point. Type in 3877, stick in the comments for me real quick. It's a certificate of mailing. 3877 is a certificate of mailing, and the 3811 is, in fact, the return receipt. Now, beautiful thing about the 3811 is according to the Real ID Act you can compel the postmaster to go get their uh, handwritten signature under the Real ID Act which is their full legal name okay and uh, that's really important so often you see a bunch of scribbles on the 3811s and you can turn around and tell the postmaster that uh, the, the uh, autographs have to be legible and have to be compliant with the Real ID Act, which means that they have to be legibly written their first, middle, and last name. And that's so um, you make sure that you're bringing suit against the proper man or woman. I did some more research on what the federal clerk of the court was saying, and I don't have an issue with the court case being marked as civil, because in the beginning my thought process was it was better off having it miscellaneously filed. I really don't want it in the public venue, so I should probably do a show of cause hearing why uh, this man's rights should be commingled with that of the enemy belligerent combatant of the United States, otherwise identified as U.S. citizens or stateless citizens. And uh, if they can't show a cause of why it should be that way, then be it resolved, this case shall be sealed and ex parte and handled in camera in chambers. So we will see if we can get that achieved and accomplished. The importance of using the 3811 and the uh, certificate of mailing. In the Bible, it tells you you're supposed to have two witnesses. Well, your two witnesses would be your 3811 and your 3877, both of which can be uh, attested to or testified to by the postmaster or the man or woman handling your mail. Which brings me to my next important point. Your uh, PS 3877 uh, mail firm book, okay? Um, that mail firm book is very important because now you have the signature of the post office employee who uh, signed in your articles of mail into the post office, proving your chain of title. So one is a certificate of mailing, the other one is the 3811, okay? So look up the certificate of mailing and its number, and then as well as the uh, 3811, the green return receipt. Now, I used to be pretty clever back in the day and write contracts all over that 3811. And it was always funny because ignorance of the law excuses no one, and they peel off that 3811 before they have them sign it. And when they sign it, they don't look at the back, and uh, it's always funny because you can write a simple parole contract on the back of that 3811, and you can actually bind the people who are signing for it. Because now, under the Real ID Act, you have their first, middle, and last name. The other reason that we want people to sign under the Real ID Act and have their first, full, uh, middle, and last name uh, is because if they sign for it, but they're not the intended party, they now become the trustees of that particular parcel of mail. Tampering with the mail, as you know, is a federal offense. Once they sign for it, now they carry the full liability of that 
parcel, that vessel, and the cargo within. So there's some importance to using your 3811s and your certificate of mailings. The round box stamp is always important, and you always want to use real stamps under the Real Stamp Act. I, uh, the Real Stamp, uh, the, the uh, Stamp Act of 1868. Okay. Any article of mail is actually a security. Everything boils down to being securities or excise taxes. That's what everything is. In, in a world of uh, economics where everything is a promise to pay sometime in the future, everything boils down to being a security, an excise tax, or a bond. A bond is something that matures in less than nine months, and a security is something that has a maturity rate over nine months, okay? The next thing that's important about holding your public officials accountable, or anybody accountable for that matter, and this is why after doing a little more due diligence, I didn't have such an issue with the clerk of the federal court. Not saying that she's correct. I don't like the fact that she labels it as civil, when in all actuality, it's a private matter before the court, civil being on the public side. Judicature Act, they commingled equity and, and uh, civil Roman law, stating that they can handle both affairs in the same jurisdiction, which I don't see it that way. And there are a lot of legal scholars that may perhaps do, but from the books that I've read, there's a clear, distinct separation between the exclusive jurisdiction of equity, where man finds his remedy, and the public sector. Where, where it deals with persons, things, in rem, at law, trust residual, trust residue, things of that nature, trustees, executors, beneficiaries, those are all things, those are all titles, titles are things. So after you send out your first friendly correspondence, you send out your first friendly correspondence, it's going to be simple, it's going to be eloquent, there are going to be no threats in your correspondence, nor will there be any threats in your notices. If you're writing things and they're threatening, please stop, because you're going to get yourself in trouble. All right, there are ways of saying fuck you, and it's with a multi-million dollar smile and a handshake. We always want to give them a way out. That shows that we've given value and consideration in more than one way. We're willing to forgive them their trespass so long as they correct the mistake that they're making. We include all the evidence in the first correspondence. The first friendly correspondence, all the evidence, all the statements and facts, we include all that in the first correspondence. And we want to show them that uh, we, of course, have the knowledge, the wherewithal, and uh, the evidence in our favor to get them to correct their wrong. Now, whether that be they're violating their oath of office, oppression under color of authority, uh, oppression under color of law, uh, false and fictitious statements, we always want to provide them with sufficient and adequate knowledge to help encourage them to do the right thing, even though their superiors may tell them, ah, oh, don't worry about it. And, We've been threatened with this shit our entire career. Don't, you ain't got to worry about this guy. I'm telling you right now, if I send you a correspondence, you better scramble. You better scramble to immediately, with insufficient time, correspond back to me. Or I will get you. No questions asked. And I know how to prosecute. And you know how to prosecute too. It's just like when you catch a kid in the cookie jar. All right? You know he's full of shit because he's got chocolate all over his fucking face. There's only one cookie left in the damn cookie jar, and he's the only one with cookie on his face. He's screwed. So the first correspondence, again, is just friendly. You can follow civil rules of civil procedure, but you really don't have to because federal rules of civil procedure, as Malika so eloquently points out, only applies to agents and agency. Now, I found it somewhere else written, and I can't draw it off the top of my head. Um, but it, uh, uh, the federal rules of civil procedure uh, affect volunteers, U.S. citizens, and participating members, agents, and agency for the federal government and state and local government. What's that? Rule 17. Rule 17, perhaps. It was actually, uh, I'm, just, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. <clears throat> I don't know if I said it to you or not. 
comments on my Facebook wall, but nevertheless, so you send your first correspondence, you use the mail, you use a 3811 and a certificate of mailing, and you get no response back, you want to be sure to issue a certificate of non-response, okay, it's very important. Most of what I'm going to be teaching you is about dictation, and I'm going to tell you what, it's a hell of a discipline. If you're not comfortable or familiar with writing daily logs and daily journals, I can assure you this is going to be a tough task for you. Where the government has many minions that log and dictate and analyze data all day long, you and you alone are the only one going to be doing this. If you plan on being successful, I suggest you get a daily journal so you can enter daily what you have accomplished, what you have mailed off, what you have done, and be so courteous to yourself as to put in your journal when they are to respond and what you are to do when they fail to respond. For example, a certificate of non-response. Then comes your first notice. Your first notice this now changes dramatically. The first correspondence was a friendly correspondence seeking remedy. This, the first notice, however, the angle and the degree of which you're writing is going to change, okay? Because now we're going to be talking and discussing about the intent to bring them into a competent court of jurisdiction to explain any lawful excuse they feel they may have for their trespass. Again, you can send them all the evidence. I like to include the first correspondence with the first notice as a courtesy copy, and I do that throughout the entire process. For example, the first correspondence went out, now the first notice is due to go out. I go ahead and send them the first notice and then behind that is the original correspondence as a courtesy copy and then the certificate of non-response so they know that I'm not playing games. Now, for many of the people out there, they won't understand what you're doing. But that doesn't much matter to me, okay? Just like what the credit card companies do to you when they're trying to default you on a debt, which D and fault actually means no fault at all. Default. Uh, it's just like this. You can't defraud anybody because there's no fraud. You can't defund anybody because there's no funds, all right? Uh, the second notice, this is where we're going to start drawing on proving intent. Is it your intent to trespass against I and cause I harm by way of extortion, by way of debt, by way of uh, 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 theft? Theft of what, you might be asking, your rights, the property of, you, uh, of I, whatever the case may be. Now, in your second notice, we're starting to drive home the point of their intent. Because by failing to respond, they acquiesce by tacit agreement that it is their intent. You might give them 10 days to respond to that again. You gotta be using your 3811s, your certificate of mailings, those are your witnesses. And of course, if you're using your PS 3877 mail firm book, then you actually know the name of the postal service worker who handled that material, that envelope, and now you can draw upon them with a subpoena to testify. Not that it'll ever get that far. They really don't need you to subpoena the postal worker. They'll take the 3877 with the round bob stamp on it, and that will be sufficient enough. And they'll take the uh, uh, 3811, and that will also be sufficient enough. Very, very rarely do you ever hear of a United States postal worker being brought into a court because, well, to be real honest, nobody ever questions the Postal Service. And I will remind you, there is a statute that provides the minute the Postal Service worker round bops and stamps your document, it is considered served, which is pretty remarkable. 
considering how big the outfit is and mistakes happen and sometimes the mail doesn't make it. However, it is part of their code that as soon as that mail is received, it's considered served. Um, so your third notice. Your third notice, you're finally going to invite them to your court. Now, this is something that was comical about the clerk of the court in Indianapolis. She wasn't actually the clerk. On the internet, it says she was a deputy clerk, but there's other other places where it says that she's not. So who knows really what what her rights, titles, duties, and obligations to the American people truly are. <coughs> Your third and final notice is to let them know of the trespass. They have trespassed. There's no question about it. And now we're going to invite them to a court. And we're going to give them seven days to respond. Seven more days to offer them forgiveness, to just correct their mistake, make it right with you. And at that point, when they don't respond, your certificate of non-response is issued. Now, you will go down to the court, file your statement of facts into the record. The statement of facts is pretty simple. It's pretty much your due process of law process that you execute. Why? Because your exhibits will be all the evidence needed. Okay? Your statement of facts can be structured as an affidavit. Your statement of facts. On December 1st, I sent out a correspondence to John Doe Smith, who at times acts as sheriff, you know, and so on and so forth. That's pretty much going to be your statement of facts because after your statement of facts is supplanted into the court case with your case file jacket number, then what ends up happening is you mark your correspondence and notices and your certificates of non-response as exhibits, okay? There's also a thing called a certificate of service. So if you're having, say, a notary serve these documents for you by way of mail, he or she will be responsible for creating a certificate of service. If you are going to utilize a disinterested third party in your process, it would be very wise and very keen of you to have the respondent's response sent to the disinterested third party as the primary receiver of all correspondence. The reason we do that is now we have a man or a woman who's a disinterested third party that can now testify that on such and such date they did not receive any mail from the respondent. So you got the respondent uh, superior and then which is let the master speak, and then you have the respondent inferior, okay? Who you're bringing the claim against. The great thing about having a disinterested third party is now you have a man or woman who's a true and accurate uh, record of the correspondence being sent, and they can also issue the certificate of service and the certificate of non-response, and they can still use the 3811s and the certificate of mailings just the same. We want to always be sure to actually use real stamps. Don't let these scoundrels pitney bow stamp your shit. Use real stamps. You want to be in the real world? You want to bring a claim against a man? We do things the correct and proper way with real stamps. Following the, real, uh, the, the Stamp Act of 1868. Real money goes on that envelope. Now, in the beginning, before you send your first notice, it might behoove you to go down to the local courthouse and get a docket number. Depending on how intellectually inclined you are, you should be able to walk out of that courthouse in about five minutes with a docket number for absolutely 
nothing. They are heavily and highly trained to discourage you and want to force down your throat their procedures and processes. I am here to tell you with first-hand equivocal knowledge, you don't have to utilize their bullshit. And it would probably be best if you didn't. See, the thing is you want to come up out of her. You don't want to be in their shit, mired in their system purporting to be justice. You got to come up out of that. All their legal mumbo jumble, just get rid of it in your head. If you've got it in your head and you're like me and memorized all these statutes, codes, city ordinances, rules, and regulations, flush that shit down the toilet because it's really not needed. That applies to them, not you. We're simply making a claim as a man against another man or woman who trespassed causing us harm. And that harm is identified by the actions that they took, whether it be extortion, robbery, so on and so forth. In the legal system, there's all kinds of loopholes. When it comes to being lawful, there are no loopholes. It was either right or it was wrong. There is no fucking muddied waters in between. It's either correct or it's incorrect. It's right or it's wrong. You're either a wrongdoer or you're not. Okay? When you finally arrive to being in the court, you've already won your case. It's over because court was held on the four corners of the paper. Due process was rightfully given and they absconded from it, which is confession and avoidance or tacit procreation and acquiescence to the notices creating the contract, which would be civil, okay? That's why after doing a little more research the other day when she marked those cases as civil, I don't have such an issue with it, such a qualm with it. I would much rather it be miscellaneous. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to submit uh, an inquiry as to why this man's private core judicial rights should be commingled with that of enemy belligerent combatants of the United States. And if they can't show a cause, then be it resolved, this case is now sealed and ex parte, kept out of the public, because it is not our intent to cause the taxpayer any grief and have to raise taxes on U.S. citizens because of the delinquency and the dereliction of duty of the public officials, which is always what ends up happening. Recently, the United States was purportedly sued for participating in genocide, crimes against humanity, and everybody goes, well, who's going to jail? Nobody. Nobody's going to jail. You wanna know why nobody's going to jail? Nobody's going to jail because it was the United States suit. It was a corporation. This is going to cause taxes to go up because none of the public officials will be held accountable for it. What will end up happening is they'll say, well, guess we got to raise taxes on us. Some of us were, uh, were uh, acting foolishly and ignorantly, and because of that, well, somebody's got to foot the bill, and Lord knows it's not the wrongdoers that foot the bill in the U.S. government. It's the people who believe in the system that foot the bill. Don't believe me? Just go ask your local prosecuting attorney what happens if you sue the agency known as the Sheriff's Department or the city or the township or the county. Naturally, everybody's taxes go up. So you really just hurt your fellow brothers and sisters because the wrongdoer doesn't get reprimanded at all. It's the fellow taxpayers that get reprimanded and screwed over by their agents and agencies dereliction of duty. So you got your statement of facts in the record. You got your exhibits all laid out. A, B, C. Now if you 
you've got more than 26 exhibits, you might want to label them A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, just to make sure you don't run out of uh, letters. The only thing you're doing in that court at that point is pressing your claim before a magistrate, an expert in contract law, property law, and trust law. But above all, you want that son of a bitch to be an expert in property law. Down there at the courthouse, they will tell you, well, all our judges are experts. All our judges are, are good with everything, and we don't get to pick and choose who gets assigned to your case. Horse piss. I'll tell you right now. Stutter and Stanley that only got a fucking 2.5 GPA and somehow managed to make it as a fucking judge is not going to be lording over my fucking case. It's not how it works. First of all, he won't be lording over shit. He's just there to rubber stamp it because everything is proper and in its place. And he's there procedurally to make sure the due process of law was followed. Not civil rules of procedure or federal rules of civil procedure or the special rules in that county for that particular court. No, 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 no. He is there just to make sure that if I gave them 15 days to respond, they had 15 days to respond, and that's that. All right? He's just there to make sure that I did the, the paperwork correctly. And once all that's in order, we wait for the wrongdoer to show up, if they even show up. Most of the time, they're not even going to bother. They're not even going to bother. So what you do at that point in time is you press your order, you press your claim. So in the correspondence and the notice, you obviously gave and provided a true bill due and owing, an itemized list of everything they owe you for. Every trespass that caused you harm had a fee, per se, associated with it, although we don't necessarily call it a fee. Maybe it's just an inherent cost. It's damage that uh, has to be assessed for value, right? You're going to have your uh, final order written up for them to sign off on. Now, they'll sign off on it. But here's the tricky part. There's this thing called a supplemental hearing. I learned about it from Mr. Anonymous. Not a whole lot of people know about it. The supplemental hearing is where you go in to get your writs of garnishment, your uh, your um, writs of execution, the liquidation of their 401k, 801k, uh, investment funds, Their IRA plans, their Roth accounts, what else? College, college uh, savings, checking, everything. In your writs of execution or your supplemental hearing, which you could do there on the spot, you want to have a list of their their assets, both business and private. For liquidation to make sure they've got enough assets to make you whole. I'm not sure which one I gotta take. That's the importance of all these uh, public officials needing to follow the law and be independently bonded. So when they do screw up, we can be made whole. Because we're coming off at them at the private side because we don't want to hurt the public sector. So anyway, that's just a little rundown, a little skibby of how you do it. And you can have this done in as little as 60 to 90 days if you do it properly. Oh, we're getting ready to go down to Nebraska and kick a little ass. That's what we're doing. And have a little bit of fun. Oh, yeah. So the 
problem with these tyrants is they thought they thought Americans were neutered, gutless, gutless wonders. Well, they stepped on a fucking landmine when they decided to kick in my front door. That shit don't fly with me. Never has, never will. And I've been known to put a few man's dick in the dirt from time to time, although I'd like to leave those violent ways behind me, and for the most part I have. But now intellectually speaking, Oh, it is so much fucking fun to take an educated knothead and let him know that his trespass against me is so egregious he should be hung for high treason and I know how to fucking enforce it. Now we're talking. That's how you take America back. It ain't with guns. It ain't with knives. It ain't with blood. It's with superior intellectual knowledge. That's how you fight these fucking creeps. This is what causes them to have nightmares at night, laying next to Edna or Martha or whatever the fuck their wife's names are. i tell you, the first thing that goes is their wives once you hit their pocketbooks. Their wives don't want to be spending the rest of their life with Elmer Fudd the Dud. Elmer Fudd the Dud. Because he fucked up, screwed the pooch, and stepped on the wrong American man. And not even American man. Just a man in general who has knowledge of natural law. That's what they're hiding from you. The spiritual wealth of natural law. Divinity in and of itself. If I didn't cause you a harm, there's not another man in this world that has a right to bring a complaint or a claim against I. Now, I know what you're all thinking. They don't bring a complaint against you, Derek. They bring a claim against your estate, and then... And then through mistaken identity, though maybe through identity theft, they turn around and hem you up a surety for it. And then don't want to execute your right of subrogation. They want to abscond from it so they could loot and plunder your estate. I saw some beginners uh, wanting to learn equity the other day. That was an interesting... Uh, hour-long skit that I watched. If you want to learn equity, one of the best things you can do is read that Bible. Now, I know there are a bunch of people that are like, oh, it's Yahweh and Yahshua, and, and there was no J in the Hebrew. I understand that. I'm very learned. I comprehend what you're saying doesn't stop me from reading the words in the book and looking between the lines and reading the parables. There are certain things in that book that the Heavenly Father would not allow to be removed, and it's quite evident. If they wanted to manipulate mankind, trust me, if they had the authority and the power, they would have altered that book a hell of a lot more than they did. Just a few things that they couldn't alter. There's no way that they can alter certain aspects of that book. That's why they removed a lot of books, because they knew they couldn't alter it. By removing the books, it allowed them to alter the book a little bit, but not very much. And it damn sure didn't allow them, and the Heavenly Father didn't allow them to remove the most important parables in that book. A lot of the maxims I speak of come directly out of that book. There's a famous uh, prosecuting attorney, Ehrlich. Jake Ehrlich is one of the best defense attorneys ever ever to exist. Jake Ehrlich, look him up. He was on the Johnny Carson show. I stumbled across one of his uh, skits on the Johnny Carson show, and he says, uh, birth certificate, that's just hearsay. There's been times it's been proven that it's nothing more than hearsay. And, uh, it's just hearsay until proven otherwise. Jake Ehrlich. First time I ever seen him come on a Johnny Carson show, I thought to myself, boy, that's the devil in Prada right there. That man is a slick, silver fox son of a bitch. He's a master at language. He just seemed to have a little too much fun on the Johnny Carson show. But I want you guys to go look him up. Jake Ehrlich. 
he wrote a prolific book about evidence. That's a fact that nothing can really be proven. There are no facts. There's nothing that can really be proven. That's why Jake was so damn good at being a defense attorney. Now, did he lose cases from time to time? You bet. You bet he did. He tells you about it on that Johnny Carson show, how, oh, how it just grieved him to, uh, to lose. Because he didn't take on cases to lose. He took on cases because he's a winner. And he likes to win. Prides himself on being the best. Back in the days when men took pride in what they did. And win, lose, or draw, they gave it their best. And when they lost, it disturbed them something fierce. We can learn from them old fools. Anyway, before I go on too much of a diatribe, I just want to share that with you this evening. That's the process for holding them accountable. There's a little bit more to it, but not much. It's pretty simple. Now it's about using the proper words, structuring it correctly. If your documents, or your notices, or your correspondence are 5, 10, 15, 50 fucking pages long, you're fucking it up. You're doing it wrong, Scooter. Stop writing with emotion. If you've got 10 pages of googly gob, you are fucking the pooch. Don't do it. You should be able to write your correspondence on two pieces of paper, maybe three to five fucking paragraphs. We don't need to know how it made you feel and that the sand in your vagina has irritated you for weeks on the matter. We are simply pointing out the facts, the trespass, what you believe to be a trespass, how it's caused you harm, and what what action, identifying the action. So John Doe Smith has caused I harm by way of trespass, by way of extortion. That's my fucking claim. That's it. Not about when he extorted me, he yelled at me, and it made me feel uncomfortable, and, and, and nobody wants to hear that shit. You want remedy? Don't write like that. If you write like that, you will get nothing. You will not solve the issue. And trust me, I used to write 90-page diatribes. Thought I was doing something badass. Nope. They don't even look at shit like that. There's this thing out there called the never-ending fucking, or never-perfect uh, affidavit. I had fucked Last time I saw it, and I love David's trade, so no disrespect, because there's a lot of hard-hitting information in there. Some of the information I use is in there. But it's, the last time I saw it was 101 fucking pages. Nobody's reading that shit. Nobody. Not in the judiciary, anyway. So you gotta refine it. Bring it down to two to three pages tops to make your poignant point. It should take you more than three to five paragraphs. Once you learn how to write like that, now you're gonna be effective. You can make a poignant point in two to three sentences, now you're lethal can financially lynch the shit out of people when you can convey your message in two to three sentences. That's when you become a badass. Guaranteed. So, with that said, I love you guys. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for joining me. I'm going to be in the air here in a couple hours, and uh, I won't be able to get anything done until uh, probably 5 o'clock tomorrow evening. Be patient with me for those of you that are waiting on something from me at this point. There are a few of you. Trying to get it all wrapped up before I had to get on the road, but there just wasn't any time. So, by 5, 6 o'clock Central Time tomorrow, I 
should be off the road. And uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful Thanksgiving if we don't have an opportunity to speak again before then. So, with that said, have a wonderful, blessed evening, a great Thanksgiving. And we'll see you guys real soon.